The National Desk, America's News, now. I worry about illness in my house all the time. To get the shot or not, a vaccine researcher weighs in on why children need the COVID-19 vaccine, while one state surgeon general is contradicting CDC guidance. Plus, promotions not paying off. The data from millions of workers revealing the reasons employees may quit. And later, dangerous duo, the new agreement between Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un. What it could mean for the national defense. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. We're glad you're with us. And on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. The criminal indictment of the president's son. We are breaking down Hunter Biden's charges, plus the possible impeachment inquiry into President Biden, putting a cap on credit card rates. The new bill on Capitol Hill that could help lower your monthly payment. Out of office for good, where the work from home movement is growing and the companies where workers are back in the building and gas price spike, how the pain at the pump is upping inflation nationwide. Right now, Hunter Biden is facing criminal charges. The president's son has been indicted by a Delaware County grand jury on three charges presented by special counsel David Weiss related to his purchase of a gun in 2018. Among the charges, lying to a federally licensed gun dealer, making false claims on a federal firearms application, and illegally possessing a gun while using drugs or being addicted to drugs. Here's the National Desk's Christine Frizzell with the details. The charges stem from Hunter Biden's purchase of a firearm in October of 2018 and lying on the application about his drug use at the time. They come less than two months after he was set to plead guilty to two misdemeanor tax charges and enter into a pretrial diversion agreement to avoid prosecution on the felony gun charge. Now it's clear he won't avoid it. Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer calling the charges a very small start. Ironically, that's the one crime that he committed that you cannot tie Joe Biden into. Federal prosecutor, now special counsel David Weiss, brought the charges following Republican criticism of his new role. The indictment comes as Republicans in Congress are demanding the president's son be issued a subpoena as part of their investigation into his business dealings, a probe that this week led Speaker Kevin McCarthy to the decision to launch an impeachment inquiry into President Biden for his alleged role in those business dealings. Biden used his official office to coordinate with Hunter Biden's business partners about Hunter's role in Burisma, a Ukrainian energy company. Questions about business and finances, not part of this indictment, but central to the investigation in the House. We're following $20 million of money that flowed into shell companies created by Hunter Biden uh, and currently we don't have the data of where that money got spent. Many Democrats pointing out the three charges against Hunter Biden pale in comparison to the 91 charges former President Trump is facing. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. New details, former President Donald Trump and 16 co-defendants will be tried separately from two defendants who requested speedy trials. Lawyers Sidney Powell and Kenneth Cheeseborough go to trial on racketeering charges October 23rd. Prosecutors say the group carried out an illegal scheme to overturn the 2020 presidential election results. Developing now, Florida's controversial Surgeon General is recommending anyone under the age of 65 should skip the new COVID-19 vaccine. Joseph Ladapo is often at odds with the most medical ed experts. He now claims the booster was approved without what he referred to as meaningful clinical trials and without proof or safety or effectiveness. He says Floridian 65 and older should discuss getting the new vaccine with their health care provider. Meantime, the CDC is recommending all Americans six months and older receive the updated COVID-19 vaccine this fall. A doctor who researched pediatric vaccines tells any parent unsure about getting their child boosted to update their shot because you can't predict which kids may have serious complications if they get infected. We've had over the three years we've had now, I just looked yesterday, 
2,400 children that have died from COVID. Over half of these kids were perfectly normal kids. They had no predisposing factors. They got COVID and for whatever reason, they got very sick and died. The new COVID-19 vaccine is out now in pharmacies and doctor's offices. Keeping an eye on your money, Republican Senator Josh Hawley wants to cap credit card interest rates at 18%. That's according to a report from the political news website Real Clear Politics. Holly said setting rates would give, quote, the working class a chance. Currently, the average APR is near 24 percent and national household credit card debt is over one trillion dollars. A New York Federal Reserve survey reveals nearly 60 percent feel it's harder now to get loans, credit cards and mortgages than it was a year ago, the highest level in more than a decade. CNBC reports an increase in credit access fear since the Fed began raising interest rates in 2022. Right now, President Biden is highlighting the differences between Bidenomics and Maganomics, ramping up criticism against Republicans ahead of a possible shutdown. Now they're turning their backs on the bipartisan budget deal. Senator Speaker McCarthy made, me, made with me just a few months ago after threatening to do something no one and came very close to do it, shutting down and reneging on our national debt. I'm going to continue to just to focus on what's the right thing to do for the American people. And the job market is holding strong and inflation is much lower than it was a year ago. Still, polls show the American people aren't feeling it. The National Desk Atra El Nishar explains. President Biden advancing his Bidenomics agenda, he says will grow the economy from the bottom up and middle out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The address follows a batch of fresh government data this week that shows rising gas prices boosted consumer inflation in August, while wholesale prices also rose. Tough news in the fight against inflation, but people are still spending. August retail sales coming in stronger than expected. If jobs and income are there, consumers will go out and spend. Deloitte economic forecaster Danny Bachman says that's a key factor in his firm's holiday shopping forecast that projects retail sales to be between three and a half and 4.6 percent higher than last year. But economists like Bachman are puzzled because even though spending is strong and unemployment is low at 3.8 percent, consumer angst is high. Two thirds of adults rate the economy as bad, according to a new CBS poll. Levels that we would normally associate with recessions, not with a three and a half or four percent unemployment rate. So so we know that there, there's something odd in the way the data is coming out. One explanation could be a drop in median household income. New census data shows 2022 marked a third straight year of decline, down 2.3 percent or about seventeen hundred dollars when adjusted for inflation. Looking ahead to the holidays, a bank rate survey shows people are stressed. We see a third of holiday shoppers worried about inflation. But bank rates Ted Rossman says this year they saw a smaller share of people who say inflation is changing their spending habits. I would caution, though, that there's a cumulative effect to all this, a cumulative effect to higher prices, higher interest rates. After a roller coaster three years with ups and downs for Americans and their pocketbooks, it may take a while for them to believe volatile times are over. In Washington, I'm Atrel Najjar for the National Desk, America's News Now. New details, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is putting his full and unconditional support behind Russian President Vladimir Putin. The two leaders met at a Russian spaceport. Putin saying their discussions covered economic cooperation and humanitarian issues, but the location suggests North Korea is looking for help in developing its spy satellite program. Experts also suspect Moscow is seeking more ammunition for its war against Ukraine. The White House now vowing retaliation if the two reach a deal. We have taken a number of entity, uh, actions already to sanction entities that have brokered arms sales between North Korea and Russia, uh, and we won't hesitate to impose additional actions uh, if appropriate. And analysts believe North Korea may have a large stockpile of aging artillery shells and rockets based on Soviet designs. Buying arms or providing rocket technology to North Korea would violate international sanctions. The pandemic forced the federal government to embrace remote work. And after a recent report found a majority of agencies' offices are at 25% capacity or less, 
Some are calling for a downsize in office space. The fact check team has more on how the work from home movement is impacting the private sector. Major companies like Goldman Sachs, for example, are calling for employees to spend more time in the office. I'm back with Connor from the Fact Check team. Is this becoming a trend now? It's looking that way, Eugene. According to a survey by Resume Builder, 90% of companies plan to implement policies that encourage or require employees to return to the office by the end of 2024. How many workers are remote? Well, we found that roughly 12.7 of full-time employees do work from home, and 28.2% have a hybrid model, so they're in the office a few days and at home the rest of the week. Sure. What do we know about how productivity is being impacted by this? Sure. Well, a report from a group called WFH Research found fully remote work is associated with 10 to 20 percent lower productivity than people who are fully in the office. However, they found that hybrid work schedules have positive impacts on productivity because of things like less commuting time and recruiting and retention rates. But there's more stats on this that we have it for you on our website if you want to go check it out. All right, maybe there's a compromise somewhere yeah. in there. Uh, Connor, thanks. And for more on this Fact Check Team topic, including links to Connor's sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit us at thenationaldesk.com. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's news now to mask or not to mask. Why a rise in COVID cases has some Americans fearing another national mass mandate. Plus, interest rates on the line again. How new numbers on consumer inflation are factoring into the Fed's next decision. New inflation numbers just released are likely impacting your money. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says inflation rose 3.7 percent, and that is the biggest jump this year, but still lower than its peak during the pandemic. Economists say the spike was largely due to a rise in gas prices, 10.6 percent in August. Food prices also saw a significant increase at 4.3 percent. Some good news, though. The price of shelter, that includes things like rent and utilities, only increased 0.3 percent. A persistently tight labor market has delivered uh, wage gains that at this point are beating prices. That means that the buying power of your paycheck is going up. And core inflation, which strips out energy and food prices, did slow in August, likely keeping the Fed on track for a rate hike pause at their next meeting. The National Desk Jan Jeff Coat continues our coverage on the new inflation report. Sitting down with the executive vice president of the National Taxpayers Union, Brandon Arnold, to break down the energy price spike. But if we're talking about energy prices here, Biden's canceled seven oil and gas leases in Alaska. We know that could have delivered more supplies, lower prices. How will we ever get a handle on this inflation if energy is going to be one of the biggest factors to inflation? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've shot ourselves in the foot when it comes to energy policy. We've left ourselves susceptible to the whims of OPEC. And that's what we're seeing now. OPEC is scaling back production. We're not producing enough domestically. And therefore, prices are rising, not just energy prices, but energy prices end up having an impact on all sorts of other goods. Because when it becomes more expensive to manufacture things because costs of energy are so high or to farm or to transport goods, guess what? All those prices, all those price increases get passed down to consumers. And we as Americans right now are paying the price for this bad energy policy that we've seen since day one out of the Biden administration. So does this mean another interest rate hike? 
You know, that's a million dollar question there. And I'm not sure. I don't think so in the short term. In the short term, you know, the Fed is going to meet next week. I don't anticipate that we will see an interest rate hike then. But come early November when they meet again, if we continue to see this troubling inflation data, I do think an, infl uh, an interest rate increase is in play there. Hopefully that won't be the case because so many Americans right now have so much debt. We have over a trillion dollars of credit card debt collectively. That's a huge problem. Yeah, and Americans right now not buying into Bidenomics according to a number of polls. Tell me how the CPI report, as you have said, is Bidenomics in action? It really is Bidenomics in action because what we've seen from this administration, again, is poor energy policy poor manufacturing policy. We need to improve our tax code to encourage more domestic manufacturing. When you have a lower production, that increases costs. So that's one of the reasons why we see so much inflation in this country, even as the Fed has done everything it possibly can to tackle inflation, bad fiscal policy, too much spending, not enough incentives to create more products domestically has led to higher inflation. And what's worse about Bidenomics, perhaps, is the fact that he keeps going out and claiming that it's doing wonders for this economy, that it's doing wonders for average Americans. When we see, like I said earlier, credit card debt skyrocketing, poverty rates increasing, incomes falling when, uh, when you factor in inflation, you see a lot of Americans out there struggling, and it's a real slap in the face to hear Biden tell them that they're doing great. Meantime, Congress has to pass 12 spending bills each year. So far this year, they've passed zero. We do have a deadline here. We're looking at a possible shutdown, which we've been through several times, as we know here in Washington. We do know a stopgap measure is expected to, to possibly buy some time, but what's your take on what we're seeing right now? What can we expect? It's a three ring circus on Capitol Hill right now, an absolute mess. And Republicans, I think, can't get out of their own way. They haven't been able to pass any of these spending bills on the floor of the House of Representatives. They had to pull the defense appropriations bill, which is the easiest appropriations bill to pass traditionally. They had to pull that from consideration because they didn't have the votes for it. So it's a complete mess. I do think there will eventually be a spending patch in order to fund the government. But I think before then, I think it's quite likely that we face a shutdown when government funding expires at the end of this month. That's really unfortunate. And again, it's a self-inflicted wound. Executive Vice President at the National Taxpayers Union, Brandon Arnold. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us here on the National Desk. Jim. Developing now, a rise in COVID cases is reigniting the debate over mask mandates. As the National Desk Angela Brown reports, some lawmakers have already introduced legislation to prevent a nationwide mandate. One bill banning federal mask mandates was introduced by Senate Republicans. That bill was killed by Senate Democrats, but more legislation could be on the way. Signs like this one requiring a mask are popping up more often as COVID cases creep up. CDC Director Dr. Mandy Cohen. I think we all wish we could leave COVID in the rear view mirror, but what it's still here and unfortunately it's still causing harm. Right now, the White House giving no signs of bringing back widespread COVID mandates. Instead, putting the decision back to the states using CDC guidelines. It is up to the schools. It is the decisions of the districts uh, at a level, right, to decide what they want to do with the guidelines that they've been provided by CDC. Just last week, an elementary school in Maryland sparking concern among parents after reinstating a mask mandate for kindergartners after several people tested positive for COVID. I can tell you moms and dads across the country are mobilizing like never before. And if we think, if any elected official at any level of government thinks that they're about to uh, get a pass by imposing mask mandates again, they have a long, uh, they have another thing coming to them. Which brings us back to the sign outside of the Dallas County Courthouse in Alabama. Our team in Birmingham reporting it's a requirement with exceptions and those not wanting to wear a mask won't be denied services. And I think it would just really be based off of the uh, unfortunately, the political lines in some areas that people are going to be more accustomed to, to complying with that mandate versus other areas where they're going to be more resistant to it. To join the discussion on mask mandates, go to my TikTok page at Angela Gets Answers. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Still ahead here on the National Desk, expanding coverage. The state now set to require health insurance companies to cover all breast cancer screenings. Plus, the disturbing body cam video from a police officer in Seattle. The clip that's sparking protests in the city when we come back.
The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. We start in Washington state where there is an investigation into a Seattle police officer's caught on camera comments about a 23 year old student who died after she was hit by a police cruiser. But she is dead. <laughs> That's not the only time the Seattle police officer talking laughs while discussing what happened here. 23-year-old Janavi Kandula, a Seattle graduate student, struck and killed by a Seattle police cruiser while she was in this city crosswalk on Dexter Avenue last January. A fellow officer was responding to an emergency call. This video just obtained from Como shows that officer en route. The officer on the body cam identified in a news release from the Seattle CPC, the Community Police Commission, as Detective Dan Arterer laughs and says, Yeah, just write a check. Just. Yeah, <laughs> $11,000. She was 26 anyway. She had limited value. The CPC's co-chair, Joel Merkel, said he heard reports that he and the colleagues' comments were mocking attorneys. Joking about how much her life might be worth, even if he was mocking an attorney, uh, is just really heartbreaking and shocking to hear. On the body cam video released by SPD on YouTube and handed over to the Office of Police Accountability for Investigation, you'll also hear the detective say this. He's going 50. That's not out of control. That's not reckless for a trained driver. It's a real big setback, and it really speaks to some of the issues with uh, culture and some of the elements at SPD. Now over to Maryland. Baltimore's population has dropped by almost 6% since 2010. And one city councilman thinks the number of cars are to blame. In a post, Councilman Ryan Dorsey said in part, our population loss is directly aligned with the trajectory of car dominance and the city's investment to cater and shift to car dominance. Baltimore residents, however, don't agree. I don't see how cars would have an effect on, on, on people leaving the city. I've never said, hey, I'm not going there, there's too many cars. I have said, hey, I'm not going there, there's too much crime. And that's exactly what people say about Baltimore City. Of the top five big cities recently named as the most car dependent, all of them have seen their populations grow, according to the most recent census. In Oregon, starting in January, a new state law will require insurance companies to cover all breast cancer screening costs. Insurance companies are required to cover the cost of annual mammograms, but not any additional screenings needed. Those screenings have co-pays that can range from 200 to over $1,000. And according to a study by the Radiology Society of North America, 21% of women forego supplemental screenings because of that. You could have those little costs chipped off um, with the diagnostic imaging. It is such a relief. According to the CDC, from 2017 to 2021, over 10,000 mammograms were performed in Oregon. Almost 12% were abnormal and required additional screening.
Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, two South Carolina state troopers made a woman's day after removing a snake from her car. My goodness, she was driving along the highway when she saw the snake slithering on the floor. The woman then called 911. The officers responding removed the snake from her dashboard. Cold and flu season just around the corner, but the FDA now says the number one decongestant in America is not effective. Phenylephrine can be found in medications like Sudafed, Allegra, and Dayquil. And right now, it's unclear if the drug will stay on store shelves. Those stories are much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. New details. America's largest newspaper chain is looking to hire reporters with strikingly specific beats. USA Today is on the hunt for a journalist focusing solely on the music and cultural impact of Taylor Swift. I know a few people that would be perfect for this position. If you are a Swifty interested in making the job your next big career move, the paper has some unique requirements. Candidates must be willing to travel internationally to capture Swift's ongoing tour and the ability to report in more than one language is preferred. The American leg of the Eras tour is expected to gross $2.2 billion, which would make it the highest grossing tour ever. Ahead in our next half hour, the critical medical shortage following a string of natural disasters this year, how the Red Cross says you can help. You're watching the National Desk America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. The White House is trying to shape that story. Speaker McCarthy is trying to shape that story. A fight to control the narrative on the Biden impeachment inquiry, what's at stake? Strengthening security, possible prison changes in Pennsylvania after a convict escapes. How you can weigh in on new safety measures. The chance of a recession could be dropping. The new numbers impacting your money, plus which regions are most at risk. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk of America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton. The White House has a new message for the media, and it's not sitting well with everyone. President Biden's team sent a letter to several news executives urging them to be tougher on Republicans and their claims that Biden should be impeached over inappropriate or possibly criminal business deals involving his son Hunter, who was indicted on gun charges. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman looks at if it's intimidation or just routine fighting in Washington. It is a battle between President Biden's White House and House Republicans, seemingly bound for an impeachment inquiry against the president. And now this letter from Biden's staff to national news executives aimed at affecting their coverage. A White House spokesperson writing, 
it is time for the media to ramp up its scrutiny of House Republicans for opening an impeachment inquiry based on lies, adding, Enclosed, you will find a 14-page appendix that comprehensively addresses the seven key lies House Republicans are suggesting. That's why we call it baseless. That's why I just called it baseless, because they have said themselves that there is no ex evidence. There does not, the evidence does not exist, and this is a political stunt. Some, like constitutional attorney Jonathan Turley, worry that the letter is akin to White House marching orders for reporters. Others call it a traditional messaging tactic. The job of a press secretary is to get the press to write exactly what the press secretary wants them to write. The job of the press is to get the press secretary to say something the press secretary doesn't want to say. And the tension is where the news is. Former press secretary under George W. Bush, Dana Perino. This is the preview of working the refs, okay? And also, here's the thing, a memo like this should not necessarily have to come out because this, as a PR person, this is your job. One media critic posting, this is not okay. The White House should not be encouraging, influencing, or interfering in the editorial strategies of America's newsrooms. Just last week, in a separate controversy, a court ruled the White House likely violated the First Amendment for trying to influence which posts about COVID social media companies should censor. And this latest fight over messaging unlikely to be the last. The White House is trying to shape that story. Speaker McCarthy is trying to shape that story. All the candidates are trying to shape that story. That's, that's what we do here in Washington. I'm Scott Thuman for The National Desk. Developing now, Chester County, Pennsylvania prison board officials say they're taking new precautions after the high-profile escape of inmate Danilo Cadocante. The board says members of the public will be able to give their opinions on a proposed $1 million investment in prison security. Plans include more fencing, cameras, and lighting. Right now, the American Red Cross is running low on blood supply, saying the U.S. is facing a national shortage. The organization points to the recent back-to-back -back disasters. Low blood supply levels are a threat to patients with an emergency blood need. People with all blood types are encouraged to donate, but there is an emergency need for type O blood and platelet donors. American Red Cross officials say they're watching Hurricane Lee and its potential impact on their ability to collect blood. Find where to donate, including details on local blood drives at redcross.org. Keeping an eye on your money, the odds of a recession here in the U.S. have fallen significantly in recent months. A new report from Moody's Analytics has it declining a 33% chance by mid-2024, and that's down from 50% earlier this year. However, some regions are more likely to experience an economic downturn than others. The West and the South are most vulnerable at 35.2% and 34%. 0.7%. Economists say those areas are most likely to be impacted by home prices and inflation. The Northeast and the Midwest face better recession odds at 29% and 32.3% as they face a population decrease and in lower inflation. Right now, the economy has a resilient labor market, but one perk that companies are offering to keep workers may actually be backfiring. The National Desk Angela Brown explains. A pay bump, promotion, two perks that usually keeps employees on the job, or does it? When the only thing your company offers are pay benefits, time off, and promotion, that's great, but that's only good as far as it goes. A promotion, not enough to keep some workers with a company, according to this new study from the ADP Research Institute. They analyzed the job histories of more than 1.2 million people right here in the U.S. working for companies that employed at least 1,000 people from 2019 through 2022. Their findings? Within a month after their first promotion, 29% of people had left their employer. Had these people not been promoted, more may have stayed. Only 18% would have moved on according to their estimate. Career specialist, Julie Balke. There are absolutely people I've talked to who say, once I get this promotion and I've got a better title and more salary, I can parlay that into something better because frankly, I'm not happy here anyway. The report pointing out people who are given more responsibility without adequate preparation, compensation, or resources could become more likely to quit. 
But keep in mind, promotions are very rare. ADP says that only about 4.5% of workers are promoted in the first two years. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Already this year, the United States has already seen more billion-dollar weather and climate disasters than ever before. This map shows the 23 disasters that each cost at least a billion dollars, according to new data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The year 2020 held the previous billion-dollar disaster record with a total of 22 events. Now take a look at this staggering figure. According to the latest numbers from NOAA, this year's disasters have cost nearly $58 billion in damage. Keep in mind, there's still four months left in the year. And NOAA is still analyzing Hurricane Adalia and whether other events, including drought and flooding in the South and Midwest, or Tropical Storm Hillary, which hit Southern California this summer, may have also surpassed the billion dollar mark. Right now, more Americans are feeling the pain at the pump. This week's averaging 385 for a gallon of regular nationwide. The fact check team explains how the spike is driving an increase in inflation. After 12 months of declines, inflation rose two straight months. So the latest, a 3.7% year-over-year increase for the month of August. I'm back with Courtney from the Fact Check team. Gas prices playing a role? They are. In fact, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they were the largest contributor, accounting for over half of the inflation increase because prices went up 10.6% in August from the month before compared to a 0.2% increase in July. Now, economists uh, expected inflation to tick up because of the higher gas prices, also uh, higher housing and food costs, uh, but diesel can also be linked to this. Right, because diesel is important for heavy transportation, industrial use, and agriculture, and it went up more than 20 cents a gallon in the last month. Now, most Americans uh, can relate to the fluctuating gas prices. Help us understand their broader impact on inflation. So it's really a cause and effect relationship. Gas prices are affected by crude oil prices, and crude oil is a major economic input. So if those prices go up, that contributes to inflation. Higher oil prices also contribute indirectly because crude oil is a key ingredient in chemicals used to make plastic. So higher prices would in turn raise the prices of many products that use plastic. That's so many things uh, tied together, you can right. say. Uh, we'll see how it all, by the way, uh, influences the Fed officials who are meeting next week on those interest rates, see if they go up again or not. Uh, Courtney, thank you. And you want to scan the QR code here on your screen for more on this fact check team topic. You can also visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. So, to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from Americans' opinions on Biden's economic plan to the debate over the new COVID booster. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. News this past week that President Biden's son Hunter indicted uh, by a special counsel on three gun charges. And House Speaker Kevin McCarthy moving ahead with an impeachment inquiry into President Biden related to Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman How's the White House responding? Yeah, Steve, look, there's a PR element to this. There's no denying that. So, of course, you would have the inquiry itself, and then there's the spin surrounding it, the White House trying to get ahead of that, uh, pushing out this letter to the heads of news agencies and essentially imploring them to take a different look at how they're covering it. In it, they write uh, that you have to uh, look that it is time for the media to ramp up its scrutiny of House Republicans for opening impeachment inquiry based on lies. And then they lay out all these different points where they try to punch holes in a lot of the Republicans' accusations. I spoke with a professor today about this who studies messaging here in Washington, D.C., and he said, look, it is the White House press secretary's job to try and make sure that every reporter writes exactly what that press secretary says, and it is the reporter's role 
to try and get the press secretary to say what they do not want to. So this is all part of this game that we typically see here in Washington, D.C., and now it's playing out regarding one of the more serious subjects being an impeachment. Right, and playing out at a time when we're almost a year out from uh, the next presidential election, going to be a big issue for President Biden. Democrats, of course, saying Republicans are using all of this as a distraction from President Trump and his former President Trump and his legal troubles. Meanwhile, the president still trying to sell his economic message to Americans, but polls show it continues to fall flat. National correspondent Atra El Nishar, what's going on with Americans' pocketbooks that may be contributing to that sentiment? Look, economists are frankly puzzled by the fact that the economy on paper is doing really well. Unemployment is low, inflation is coming down. But when you ask people how they feel, it's a whole different story. So what's the disconnect between sentiment and facts and figures uh, about what I just, I just listed? I talked to one of the top economists at Deloitte this week, and even he said he's at a loss for why there's such a disconnect and sentiment is at a level that you would typically associate with a recession, not 3.8% unemployment. Now, one thing that could be contributing to that really rotten sentiment is the fact that uh, median household uh, income is dropping and it dropped for the third year in a row in 2022. We learned that this week from the Census Bureau. It dropped about 2.3% uh, when adjusted for inflation before taxes. Now, after taxes, it dropped closer to 8 9%. So that could be part of it. Uh, but could, it could also just be the fact that it's been three years of pure chaos, the pandemic, uh, inflation north of 9%. Uh, uncertainty about who the next president is going to be, uh, you name it, climate change, so many issues that people, uh, frankly, are, are unsure about how the, it will impact the navigation of their budget for the rest of the year, the year, not to mention, is there going to be a recession? So it is really tricky uh, for people to plan, uh, but when you look ahead to the holiday shopping forecast that Deloitte and bank rates put out, people are still expected to spend. We saw that reflected uh, in this week's retail sales report that showed spending is pretty much keeping up with inflation. So people are feeling really rotten, but they're not necessarily spending like it. And it's an interesting thing to watch, especially again, as we talk about next year's election, incumbents uh, don't want to see Americans have a negative sentiment about their wallets and pocketbooks. We'll see how this all plays out in the coming months. Uh, and debate continues about COVID boosters and potential mask mandates, but also about where COVID came from. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, you've reported on new whistleblower allegations involving the CIA. Tell us about that. Well, Steve, since Republicans took control of the House uh, back in the 2022 midterms, they've vowed to dig into the origins of COVID. So that's where this is coming from. A CIA whistleblower reportedly went to Republican leadership on the Hill and said they had some information and some pretty concerning allegations that the CIA bribed some of their top officials to change their views on COVID when digging into where exactly this uh, pandemic virus came from. Now, according to this whistleblower, there was a team of seven at the CIA analysts who were investigating the origins of COVID. Six of those analysts, this again, according to the whistleblower, who is still anonymous, uh, were leaning towards saying that this uh, virus came from a lab leak specifically the lab in Wuhan where they were studying coronaviruses. Now, reportedly, one of those seven, though, was in favor of the nature theory that this came from the wet market and jumped from animals to humans. When the CIA came out with uh, their report on COVID, they said they couldn't uh, discover where, they couldn't figure out where it came from. And according to this whistleblower, that's because those six officials who were in favor of the lab leak theory were offered substantial financial bribes to change their opinion. Um, but again, this whistleblower is still anonymous, although according to House Republicans, he is or he or she is a very high level, credible CIA official. So Steve, a lot of questions here. And, and also why, if, if these allegations are true, why would the government favor one origin theory over the other? Kayla, Atra, Scott, thank you all for your excellent reporting and your hard work. Back to you. Developing now, a new report suggests American schools are failing the COVID generation. It was published by the Nonpartisan Center on Reinventing Public Education at Arizona State University. The report states older students in particular are still struggling to regain their academic footing after years of disruptions. Among the key findings, the average ACT score is at a 30-year low. Nearly three-quarters of schools reported increases in chronic absenteeism in post-pandemic years, and a fifth of students graded their schools poorly on mental health support. 
We're also learning new details about where COVID relief funds ended up. New numbers show one out of every $7 in unemployment benefits likely went to someone who did not qualify for aid. The National Desk, Christine Frizzau, shows us where that money went. In the height of the pandemic, the goal was simple. Get as much money out as possible, as fast as possible, to those who needed it the most. An individual could come in and all they had to do was sign a form saying, I'm entitled to this money, please give it to me. That a number of fraudsters were more than happy to sign that form to get the benefits. Fraudsters and mismanagement of those funds, it turns out, have cost the country a shocking amount of money. In a new report, the Government Accountability Office estimates the amount of fraud in unemployment insurance programs during the COVID-19 pandemic was likely between $100 billion and $135 billion, or between 11 and 15 percent of the total amount of those benefits paid out. And this was one of many COVID aid programs, including the Paycheck Protection Program, to be deeply defrauded. Just last month, the Department of Justice announced it was taking action against 371 defendants for more than $800 million in fraud, dozens of whom had connections to violent crime. The sweep included the disruption of 30 members of a street gang in Wisconsin, who used proceeds from an unemployment fraud scheme to solicit murder for hire. And it wasn't just Americans. Transnational criminals also seeped into the system and took millions. In total, COVID aid has now reached $5 trillion. Experts say the biggest oversight failures were a lack of controls at the outset and the lack of use of data or current technology. To see which um, applications came with IP addresses that were overseas IP addresses. Pretty simple check on this day and age. It wasn't done in most instances. Lessons learned too late to prevent hundreds of billions of dollars from being stolen. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Still ahead here on the National Desk in Camp and Cleanup, residents raising safety concerns as Seattle attempts to curb its homeless crisis. Plus, water quality crisis, a West Virginia community outraged after being asked not to use city water. This is the National Desk America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From homeless encampment cleanups in Washington state to a hunter recovering after a grizzly bear attack in Montana. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start with a West Virginia community forced to use bottled water after a failure at a treatment plant. <laughs> I'm afraid to even, even touch the water. While most Payton City water customers are not as intimidated as Teresa Utt, some 4,000 customers in Wetzel and Tyler counties have been dealing with a do not drink, do not use water system since the mid-August discovery that a toxic dry cleaning chemical, PCE, worked its way past equipment that should have stopped it. It has been hectic. Um, Trying to pay for our water ourselves, we only get one case of water for a family of five. 
City officials armed with preliminary good test numbers on Monday morning expected a return to normal after flushing the system, though additional steps will be needed from customers. At this point now, we've pumped probably somewhere in the neighborhood eight, nine million gallons of water out through the system and out, so there should be, if it's any, if there's any left in the system, it's a very trace amount. My first reaction was, is he even gonna make it? Rudy Norlander runs a side-by-side -side rental business, and this weekend, a dad and son duo asked him to help track a wounded deer near Big Sky, Montana. They were tracking the deer, and he came upon a smaller bear. Rudy got out of his vehicle when a different, larger bear came out from behind a tree. He had one second from the time that he saw the grizzly charging him to fire. Carrie says Rudy is using a whiteboard to communicate, and he hasn't lost his sense of humor. On his whiteboard, bear French kissed me. And and she laughed and she goes, oh, I bet it had bad breath. And he shook his head, yes. Washington State is closing in Canvas. It's getting people housed. The state has closed 30 camps through its right-of-way initiative, which Inslee says is now running out of money. Some of these camps have only been shut down after complete chaos like this explosion at a drug camp outside Harborview Medical Center, this massive fire last month at Mercer Street. There was a murder here at Myers Way, and seniors across the street reported hearing frequent gunfire. We're making progress on these things. I know that's stunning sometimes to report, but it's true. But in the meantime, for those seniors who've had to live around this for four or five months, it's a problem. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's the frustrating. Answer is Very frustrating. Working on it. So if that was his answer to your question, it's not an adequate answer because it's not a solution. Diane Radishat raised concerns about the camp in the spring. But the process of getting to the table still major, major problems. She says communities shouldn't have to wait months on end for action. And still ahead, these stories making headlines next week from the state sent to resume abortion services to a new rate hike decision. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, Monday, Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin says it will resume abortion services in the state. The decision comes after a ruling that the state's pre roe ban didn't apply to consensual medical abortions. On Tuesday, President Biden will travel to New York for the 78th session of the Union Nations General Assembly. The president will address the assembly Tuesday morning. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is also expected to speak. Then on Wednesday, the Fed will announce its decision on more possible rate hikes. Right now, most economists are predicting the Fed will keep rates steady this period. Keeping an eye on your money, air travel is expected to be a lot cheaper this fall. A new report from travel booking app Hopper shows prices for domestic trips this month and in October down 29% compared to the summer prices. Trips to Europe are down 31%. Airfare is typically cheaper in fall when demand drops after summer vacations, but a slowdown to the post-pandemic travel surge is also expected. That's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News Now. 
Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings and you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of The National Desk. I'm Dee Dee Gatton and from all of us here, have a great week.